to that look like it's begun. Oh, there we go. Okay, hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night to everyone who's joining us today for the Pierce and Spring Days uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Mike Hogan, and I'm Chia Suan Chong. And we are both uh, ELT and communication skills trainers, teacher trainers, and authors. And for the past year or so, we've been working pretty heavily on a new teacher development course that's entirely online to help practicing teachers develop in their practice, specifically in very active and involved ways for their learners. And so we're gonna be speaking about that today, but specifically showing you some examples and some ideas from the program itself. Um, we'll tell you a bit more about the program, the, the certificate course at the end, which is the, the Pearson Cert PT, accredited by Trinity College London. Uh, but for now, we're going to dive in and give you some various examples of activities that you can use with your learners, taking the theory that we know and putting it into practice. So I'm going to hand over now to Chia for the first section of today's webinar, and I'm going to join you again a little bit later. So as Mike says, um, I'm going to kick off the session. I'm Chia, and it's wonderful to see all of you here today. There's loads of you from so many different countries in the world. And what always amazes me is no matter which part of the world we teach English in, the materials that we use, um, the methods that we use are fairly similar in some ways. I suppose we could come to an agreement that the communicative approach to teaching English, no matter which end of the communicative approach you belong to, is, um, is, is kind of something that unifies a lot of English language teachers. But what exactly is the communicative approach? Now, in this session, we're going to be looking at some theories about language learning and how that's being applied, whether it's through the materials and resources that we use or the methodology that we apply, the approaches that we apply in our language classroom. Um, so starting with the communicative approach, what is the goal? We talk about communicative competence, um, something that we um, started to talk about since Del Himes coined the term communicative competence. But what does that actually mean? Communicative competence talks about our ability to use language to communicate successfully. And I suppose this means that we are going not just we we're teaching not just grammar, but we're going beyond grammar. We're talking about um, the ability to understand social context and to use language appropriately to suit the context. We're talking about understanding discourse, whether it be written discourse or spoken discourse, and how these sentences that we learn to form work together as a whole text and how we learn to communicate meaning through these texts. We also talk about communication strategies, strategies that we use for um, making ourselves understood, but also for understanding others, to keep interactions and conversations going, to build relationships, to, re to, to, to resolve conflict, to build rapport. All those things are included in this very broad umbrella of communicative competence. When we talk about communicative competence and how we can help our students become more communicatively competent, we have to talk about the interaction hypothesis. Can anyone in the chat field tell, tell me who, whose name is related to the interaction hypothesis? So what is the inter interaction hypothesis? The interaction hypothesis states that interactions themselves promote language learning. This might seem kind of obvious, but if we look at some of the lessons we do today, um, we worry about how we present grammar, how we present lexis, whether we're providing enough control practice. And if we look, okay, thank you, Stephen Krashen, not quite, not Chomsky, let's try again. Um, <laughs> if we look at the interaction hypothesis, it states that interactions themselves, without the grammar focus, without the control practice, can actually promote language learning. Um, so we've got a correct answer here from Lovelyn. Michael Long, unfortunately, who passed away recently, uh, the late Michael Long is the founder of the interaction hypothesis. And he believed that by putting learners together, by putting people together to chat, to talk, that itself will promote language learning. 
Because it is through interacting that we start to realize that someone doesn't understand what we are saying. And therefore, we try to refine our language. We try to correct ourselves to find the right words, the right grammar, to make ourselves understood so that that interaction can continue, so that we are able to understand and be understood. And it is through interacting that we learn to communicate. Now, this theory is supported by, someone mentioned Vygotsky. Um, Vygotsky talked a lot about collaborating, um, you know, putting learners in pairs and groups to collaborate, and that itself helps them to, to build an understanding, um, a cognitive awareness of language and how it works, and helps them to actually put it to use. Now, we do that a lot when in our language classes, when we do what we call fluency exercises, speaking exercises, when we get students to work in pairs to compare answers and interact with each other. Um, we are essentially carrying out this hypothesis. We are, we are essentially getting students to learn by interacting. Um, here we got Anastasia who says, communication urges the listener and speaker to keep on raising his or her autonomy, very much so without the teacher to tell you exactly what to say, uh, without controlled practice, given that free reign to use all the language resources that the student has to negotiate meaning. That is how language learning happens. Um, this is a, a little comic strip um, that I wrote for the CERT PT course that was um, very, I, I can't draw to save my life. So this was very much um, made a reality by our designer, Rod. Um, it exemplifies what negotiating meaning means. When we interact, we perhaps might struggle in a second language, in a foreign language, to get ourselves, to make ourselves understood. But it is through that back and forth, you know, talking, clarifying, um, and taking turns that we negotiate and we figure out what we mean. And by allowing students to interact, to communicate freely, by working in pairs, we're allowing them the opportunity to negotiate meaning. So don't be afraid of students struggling. Don't be too keen to jump in if they are struggling. They seem to be struggling to, to say what they mean because that's learning in progress. That's learning happening right before your eyes. And that's what we want to see, them struggling and negotiating meaning as they work in pairs and groups and interact with each other. So many of you say, hey, look, we know this. We know that the communicative approach is great. We know that interactions are great. But, you know, in an online environment, this can prove really difficult. How can we do this online? You know, to start with, my students don't want to turn the cameras on. So how can we get them speaking to each other? How can we get them interacting, doing pair work and group work in the same way that we did in a face-to-face -face situation? To start with, I often talk about that culture of interaction that as a teacher, we need to promote. I talk about teachers being sort of the energetic antenna of the classroom. We set that culture. And if the culture of that classroom is teacher talk, everyone listens, then that becomes that set culture of the classroom. But if the culture of the classroom that you decide to set is one of immediate interaction, one where students get a lot of opportunities to communicate and to talk about what they know and what they believe and what they feel, then students over time will gradually get into the swing of things and become part of that culture. So how can we foster such a culture of interaction? First things first, I think if you're doing a virtual class or even a face-to-face -face class, get students interacting within the first few minutes. Start a lesson and within the first few minutes, give them an interactive task. Now, this interactive task might be a simpler form of interaction. You might not want students to, within the first few minutes of the lesson, um, immediately turn on their cameras and start giving you, you know, extended opinions about a very serious topic or a debate, what you might instead do is give them simpler forms of interaction. For example, you might start with polls, multiple choice questions, 
such as a famous ELT activity that we do in face-to-face -face classroom all classrooms all the time. True or false? One of these sentences is false. Which one is it? In the in the chat field, very, very quickly, if you know me, you might already know the answer. True or false? One of these sentences is false. Which one is it? I've got a quite varied answers there. Vincent, I'm good to see you here. Yes, actually, Vincent says shaved head, question mark, and that actually is true i did used to have a shaved head the one that is false is a not many people guessing a in the chat field interestingly a i did not i have never done judo i was never a judo champion but i was an actress and yes i used to have a shaved head here is a picture of it pictures are a great way of interacting with students. Pictures are a great way of getting students um, to build their rapport with you and to build a relationship with you. But before you get students to share their pictures and their photos and the images they find online, perhaps as a teacher, we can create that culture of sharing. And we could share our photos, perhaps you might not have a shaved head photo to share, but you might want to use photos from your past, your childhood, or even photos with your friends, your social life, photos that you would deem appropriate for your classroom. So Faisal says, what's the reason for sharing your photos? There are many reasons for sharing my photos. Photos in course books and course materials often act as a prompt for description, describe the photos, compare and contrast. But what better way to engage students than to use real photos of real people, photos of their teacher? Um, someone's asking, where am I in the photo? I am the birthday girl, the little, little child who is four years old, right in the middle of that picture. I use photos for many reasons. I get students to practice used to. Um, I use it to teach the third conditional. I get students to arrange my photos in chronological order and then tell a story of my life. I then get my students to bring their own photos into the classroom and they get to talk about their own photos using, for example, used to in pairs, in groups. The engaging activity itself, because it involves real people, because it involves their classmates, their teachers, get students to really feel like they really want to interact, to really want to communicate in that class. So the lesson here is whether you use photos or something else, the lesson here is engage your students, give them a topic, a task that would genuinely involve them and make them want to do the task, not because it promotes English learning, but because the task itself is engaging and interesting. You can also use the chat box. Chat boxes are simpler forms of interaction than say turning on your camera or turning on your microphone and do brainstorming tasks like this one. Have you heard of Kim's game? Now I'm gonna give you five seconds to look at this picture, look at it very, very carefully. And then I'm gonna ask you a question about the picture. Are you ready? Here we go. What is on the white desk? In the chat field very, very quickly, what is on the white desk? There are a few tables in that picture, but there's a white one. There's a white desk, a kind of cream colored desk. Can anyone tell me what is on that desk? Missed it. Some of you said laptop, globe, interesting. Game, computer. All right, shall we have a look and check your answers? Now it's going really, really fast. If you do this in class, you might give students you know, 10 more seconds to look at a picture. You might say, okay, you have 20 seconds to look at this picture. Then I'm going to take that picture away and you're going to tell me about it. This is an activity that's really easy to use in a virtual classroom and a face to face classroom. Here's another question What movie references? Oh, Vincent, you have got it. It is a photo, a picture that depicts lots of different things, props from movies. Can you find some movie references in this picture? Now the question, what was on the white desk? If you can see, those are pens, there is a ring, there are some pills taken from the matrix, um, but lots of other references in this picture. Now you find this on social media all the time, you know, what movie references can you find? What pop songs can you find? What bands, what music bands can you find? Use those pictures, get students to spot the movie references, spot the difference, and use it in your virtual classroom as an opening activity. It helps to foster that culture of interaction.
Here's another brainstorming activity um, taken from a Adam Anderson from the City of Glasgow College, who has very kindly agreed to share this with us. He's used Padlet with his ESOL class in a very simple way. He's posted a picture. He says, what's in your bag? This is what's in my bag. What about your bag? What's in your bag? Very simple activity for an elementary class. Students have then come in to the Padlet to then say, in my bag, I've got a pen, etc. Simple activities that can easily be done in a virtual classroom. In order to cultivate that culture of interaction, we need to ask safe but engaging questions. As we said, engagement is key here. And to ensure that this task contains a gap. Now, what do I mean by gap? A gap is a piece of missing information that gives students a reason to communicate with each other. For example, we might have an information gap. We love information gap activities in ELT, and they work so well in a virtual classroom room, put students in breakout rooms, student A has some information, student B has a different set of information, get them in breakout rooms to communicate that gap, that information gap to each other. Here is an example, uh, by permission of Beatrix Price, who's allowed me to use this picture, she, uh, she gave one student um, an illustration from a book, and she had that student describe that illustration without showing their partner the photo. <clears throat> and student B then drew this lovely drawing of what she thought the picture represented. They then took, the students then took a lot of pride showing their classmates in open class that the result of that information gap activity. Another possibility is to use these how-to videos, how-to pictures online, give student A a picture, get them to explain how to do something to their partner in a breakout room. Perhaps student B might have a tie and student A might then use their drawing or their illustration to explain, not to show, but to explain to student B how they should tie a half Windsor knot. Now, obviously, you don't have to use this very image, but there are lots of different how-to videos and how-to um, images online that you could use to, in your information gap activity. Another example of a gap is a reasoning gap. A reasoning gap could be a critical incident like this. Give students a story, and in that story, there is a conflict. There is a misunderstanding. There is some kind of miscommunication. Students have to look at the story and then in pairs and groups interact and talk about what they think happened and unpack that story and what advice they might give um, the characters in the story. After all, everyone likes giving advice. I love using critical incidents in my classes and I think it's a great motivation for students students to talk about real world issues and things that they might relate to. Sometimes they might forget they're learning English and they might really get involved in an interaction that is engaging. And that's kind of my favorite kind of classes. The third kind of gap is the opinion gap. A debate, for example, you know, about working from home, put students in, in groups, one group to agree, one group to disagree and give them the opportunity to fill the other group in with their opinion, so an opinion gap. Speaking of gaps, there's a different type of gap here. In Eng when we learn English, when we learn any language, it's really important that we get students to notice the gap. What is this big gap we're talking about here? The gap here in question is the gap in knowledge. Students need to know that what they are saying is not getting the message through. If students say, I go to the beach, and you say, oh, you're going to the beach tomorrow, and they say, oh, no, I, me I meant yesterday. Students have noticed that you have misunderstood them because they've used the wrong tense, and that gives them motivation to then get it right and to use the right vocabulary, to use the right grammar so that they can get their meaning across. After all, we're not teaching students to use grammar and vocabulary for the sake of learning grammar and vocabulary. We're teaching them grammar and vocabulary so that they become more communicatively competent. 
Another idea about noticing is that we can't learn something until we are aware of, of it in the input. Anyone in the chat field could tell me who said this. So we had Michael Long with the interaction hypothesis, who came up with the noticing hypothesis. This person noticed that, you know, there might be lots of um, input in the class and the students might not even realize you know, you might walk around the street and you might hear all these different grammar structures, but you might not even notice it until you are forced to notice it. Have you ever been in a situation where you think nobody ever uses the third conditional or the second conditional, but right after you've been taught it, suddenly you hear it everywhere. So in order to get students to notice notice the grammar structures, to notice that these grammar structures do make a difference in meaning. We use these consciousness raising activities like these ones. So in the chat field, yes, thank you very much. So yes, Richard Smith is the person who came up with the noticing hypothesis. Thank you very much for your answers. You're all spot on. And here is a way of getting students to notice, to notice how much that grammar does matter. So the sentence that's the odd one out is indeed A. You are all very good, ELT teachers. And why A? Why is A the odd one out? In the chat field, if you care to. So they all, all four sentences feature the present continuous, but like Sonia says here and Solon, A uses the present continuous to talk about the future. This is an activity that you can do in the classroom in a virtual classroom even, to get students to raise their awareness of how grammar structures can have an impact on meaning. Here's one last one from me before I hand over to my partner, Mike. Um, which sentence is the odd one out in this case? A, B, C, or D, they all feature relative clauses. Okay, lots of B's there. And do you, would you care to give your reasons? Why B? Okay, the answer is indeed B. Okay, so it's about what's in the subject and what's in the object position, who you spoke to. The boy is actually in the object position. I spoke to the boy. Um, very good. And here we look at, the we were raising consciousness of the different positions of nouns and words and, and, and how grammar kind of works in a full sentence like this. All right, I'm going to pass on to Mike, who's going to tell you a little bit more of about a different, slightly different aspect and sli slightly some slightly different theories about language learning. Over to you, Mike. <laughs> Lovely. Great. So thanks a lot, Chia. Um, so I am going to take a slightly different switch of focus and think a little bit about, um, you know, the last year. Uh, it's been a challenge for all of us uh, and for our learners. And, and, you know, we've all had to adapt to teaching and to our teaching practices in very many different ways. Um, and one of the things that really might have kind of affected us and also affected our learners is our motivation. And so thinking a little bit about motivation, what does a motivated learner look like? What do they do? How do they act? How do they interact with others? Um, and, you know, so generally motivated learners, they're interested in learning, they listen, they take notes, they participate actively in the activities. They don't give up easily. They've got perseverance. They've got, they've got levels of resilience, which have all been tested in the last year. They ask questions, they do their homework and so on. Um, and so potentially, learners that might be struggling with their motivation or maybe even potentially lacking in motivation don't have don't have these characteristics they're not necessarily visible and available to see so before thinking about that it's useful to think about well what motivates our learners where where do learners derive motivation from or also where do we derive our motivation from and so we can distinguish between what we call extrinsic and intrinsic motivation Extrinsic motivation is sources of motivation which come from outside of us. So, for example, I'm learning English because I want to pass an exam. I want to get a better job. I want to be able to travel to a country in which I'll need English to communicate and so on. These are all external reasons. 
internally intrinsic reasons is maybe because I want that sense of achievement to know that I've progressed a level or that I can now do things in the language that I couldn't do three months ago or six months ago. Um, it can increase my self-confidence. Maybe I'm curious about learning about new cultures and the world through language as well. And so these are all what we would call intrinsic motivation factors. And so everyone's motivation coming onto a course and in your lessons is going to be different. But generally, studies have shown that learners who expect to be successful in their learning are more motivated. And so then we've got the question, okay, well, how do, how do we define success for our learners? Or more importantly, how are our learners defining success for themselves? Because success can mean different things to different people. Is it about the good grammar or the ability to communicate that Chia was speaking about earlier on? Is it about passing tests? And so we can't assume that we know what success means for our students. We can't assume that what we believe success means is the same as what our students believe it means. And so just like Chia was speaking about creating this culture of interaction and this culture of communication amongst the students and within the lessons, we also need to create this culture of communication and interaction with us as well so that we're not making assumptions about their drivers behind why they're in our lessons um, and what they hope to achieve from them and how they will measure their own successes. OK, so I mentioned before, it's been it's been a pretty, pretty tough year uh, for for probably all of us here. Motivation is dynamic as well. Motivation is something that can change over time. And so some of us who maybe were, you know, were tired and stressed by traveling through cities during rush hour to get to our lessons and get to our schools and wherever we were teaching, maybe as we've all had to start teaching from home and online, motivation has increased because there's less traveling time, there's more time to spend at home or with families or things like that. But on the other hand, it could have had a massive effect on people's motivation in the other direction because frankly, the communication interaction patterns that we have virtually are not the same as face-to-face. -face. People maybe have had to struggle with the technology as well and using the technology. Um, or maybe, uh, you know, they, they don't necessarily have a room in which they can learn from home um, because there's shared home environments and things like that. Um, Gurkhan says, if a student loves his or her teacher, he or she will be motivated to learn English or any other subject. Yes, I mean, the, 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 the teacher plays a massive role in motivating our learners and in how we can help our learners be motivated. If you think back to your teachers from, from school yourself and the ones that motivated you and how and why, maybe it wasn't by doing anything particular, but it was just by being themselves uh, or the ones that potentially demotivated you as well um, might've had the opposite experience. So thinking about motivation in the last year, how, how have you felt? Please throw, throw a few comments into the, into the chat field for me. How have you felt in the past year? How have you felt your motivation? Has it been, in which way has it been dynamic? Down, up and down. Motivated, down, okay, stressed, overwhelmed. So like I said, for, for very many reasons, it's been, it's been a tough year. But the challenge here as well is that if we are feeling stressed or we are feeling down in any way, that's gonna come across in our lessons, in how we're teaching and how we're communicating and interacting. How about your learners? How have they felt in the last year? Have they enjoyed not having to travel into school for the lessons? Have they enjoyed being able to do it from home? Log in, log out easily without losing time going anywhere? Or have they maybe felt challenged, overloaded, more relaxed? They miss school. They miss each other. They miss interactions maybe, yeah. Technology stress as well, yeah. So this is, so this is the challenge. So, so you know, how our students are feeling and how we are feeling is going to have a massive, massive impact on how learning happens, how teaching happens and how success happens. And so I think it's really important to build this culture of communication. Ask your learners these questions. Do this activity I've just done with you with your learners as well and have a discussion to try and find out more about how they're feeling and things that you might be able to do to help them feel better and motivate them more uh, or things that maybe you could do differently or stop doing that maybe aren't helping. So, you know, 
there are very, very many ways that teachers can influence motivation. Like many of you said in the chat field as well, thinking about teachers that you've had in the past or thinking about students, you know, really being motivated to learn from, from a particular teacher. And so these are many of the things that we can help learners with um, and building on this, you know, this, 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 this community and this culture of interaction that Chia was speaking about earlier on as well and really getting learners feeling that they're progressing by noticing the language and by by learning through interacting these are you know there are many different ways that we can help our learners uh, develop their motivation think about it and and improve it and so kind of leading on from that a very core driver of motivation is is how we're feeling what our certain you know state of well-being is and how can we use uh, mindfulness to help us become more motivated learners and have more success in what we're doing. And I think, you know, now more than ever, after the last 12 or 15 months that we've all had, these topics, I think, are more important than ever to actually bring into the classroom, discuss them with your learners, um, and think about what strategies you can use with them to help them feel better, do better, and achieve better. So very quickly, a few quick true or false questions. I've numbered them for you to, to help you. Okay, question number one, well-being relates to how people feel and function on a personal and social level and how they evaluate their lives as a whole. True or false? True, lots of trues coming through. Okay, yeah, so it's basically how are you feeling and how that feeling impacts on how you can function. Okay, number two, there's an important link between well-being and learning. True or false? Number two, again, loads of trues. If we're coming into an environment stressed, anxious, overwhelmed, overloaded, it's going to have a negative effect on our ability to focus and learn. And the opposite is also true. Okay, mindfulness. Number three, mindfulness is when your head is full of many things and you're able to multitask well. <laughs> yeah, so this is false. This is when your mind is full but it's not necessarily being mindful. Being mindful is, is being there in the moment, being focused and paying attention to what you're doing. It's about the ability to switch off distractions. And through that, we can also manage our emotions better. We can build social skills better. We can be more focused on what we're here to do through mindfulness and through mindfulness activities and mindfulness techniques. And so number four, Mindfulness can help learners reduce attention problems while improving well-being social skills. Well-being and social skills. So, yeah, so the answer to that is also true. I've kind of already answered it for myself as well. So thinking about how well-being affects learning is if, if a learner is not feeling very good in a learning environment, if they're not feeling very, if they don't have high levels of well-being on any given day, it's going to be very difficult for them to learn. On the other hand, if they're overly challenged in the learning environment, the activities are too difficult for them, they're not experiencing success, then that is also going to have a negative effect on their well-being. So we end up in a bit of a downward spiral, perhaps. Okay. Poor well-being can have a negative effect on motivation, learning experience and success, and poor learning success and experience can have a negative effect on well-being. Okay, the opposite can also be true, as I've said already. So thinking about what this might look like in practice, particularly at the beginning of a new course, a new term, a new semester, new day, it's class one. Many students might be eager, happy, looking forward to it, excited, interested, and so on. Looking at the, looking at the students kind of near the front row, but then we've got a bunch of them in at the back. They're looking a little bit worried, a little bit anxious, a little bit nervous. Maybe they haven't necessarily had good learning experiences in the past. So it's really important to have these discussions and conversations with your students throughout your course, but also at the beginning of the course in terms of how are they feeling? And if they're feeling nervous and anxious, then address those and discuss their concerns with them and how you might be able to help them. So it's about really having this develop, developing this culture of openness and discussion, checking in with them, how are they feeling? And so mindfulness, as I said a moment ago, is about being there in the moment, being present, being not distracted, okay? And so it can really, really help with student interactions, 
with social skills. It can help you with classroom management, not only for your learners to be mindfully focused and there, but also for you to be mindfully focused and there and in your lessons. OK, so here's here's a selection of activities you can do with your learners. And I want you to think for a moment, do the activities I'm suggesting here relate to mindfulness or well-being? Put a raisin in your mouth and focus on the texture and taste of it. So you can throw some answers in the comment field or you can just think about them in your head if you like. I've numbered them for you if you'd like to put in some numbers. I'll show you all my answers at the end. Number two, a lesson focusing on happiness and what makes you happy. Number three, ask students to keep a diary of their social media usage and screen time, for example, throughout a week, and then use that as the basis of a lesson for discussion, for plotting graphs, for describing graphs. There's loads of language work you can get out of these, but you're also addressing a very important topic in question here around your learner's emotional state and how it is affected throughout the week, either positively or negatively by their screen and social media. Number four, ask your students to visualize a place that makes them feel good. Guide them through it with questions. What it looks like, what it sounds like, what it feels like. Is it light? Is it dark? Is it warm? Is it cold? You can get students to inter interview each other about this as well. So there's loads of interaction opportunities around this subject and topic. Draw a curve which maps out how you and your students feel at different times during the day. It's sometimes called a stress curve, but I think that maybe also puts a negative focus on it. Although it's useful to focus on the times that you might identify are stressful for you. So then you can think of strategies to try and mitigate that. And just the activity of talking about this is really helpful and useful, not only for your learners, but also for you. Number six, ask students to keep a diary of the typical things they do in a week and how they feel about them. Where are the highs? Where are the lows? Where do they feel energetic? Where do they feel lethargic and, and lacking energy completely? What excites them and interests them? What do they dread? And so on. And the seventh one, ask students to close their eyes and focus on the thoughts in their mind. Is their mind wandering? Are they thinking about what they're going to do after the lesson? Are they thinking about how hungry they are? Are they thinking about something else that might be bothering them or, or exciting them? Are they thinking about your lesson and the activity that they're in? <laughs> Hopefully, ideally, because otherwise they're potentially distracted. But if there are distractions there, it's important to get them out. So to run through the different ideas, I can see you've, you've, you've been commenting throughout with lots of M's and M's and W's throughout. So hopefully you 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 got them right with the answers that I've come up with as well. Now these are all just different examples, but the core of what I'm trying to get at is is that it's important to acknowledge that how our learners feel and how we feel is going to massively affect our ability to teach and their ability to learn. And so we should bring these themes and topics into our lessons actively through discussions and other activities like this. You'll be able to practice and teach a lot of different elements of language and questioning and vocabulary and things like that. But it's all around a subject and a topic, which I think is incredibly important. So um, and also you and your own mindfulness. You know, this is also really important as teachers. We've been under lots of stress in the last year. And so some ways that you can help develop your own mindfulness in your lessons is to focus on the now, focus on the lesson that you're in and truly listen to what your learners are saying and, and not necessarily about what you want to say next or the next stage of your lesson plan. So don't get stressed about the lesson plans. Embrace the flow of the lessons and spend a little more time on one thing or a little less time on something else or if the learners want to tangent off to something else. If you worry and stress too much about following a fixed structure, it's only going to be negative for you inside as well. And that will come across in how you feel and how you interact with others as well. Stop worrying about what your students think of you. I'm sure they think you're an amazing teacher. And if you're helping them learn and you're helping them stay motivated and succeed, then you're bringing them forward. You're bringing yourself forward as well. And so beware of your own reactions as well, because sometimes you might actually be reacting in a way that you're not aware of through facial gestures or expressions or things like that. Focus on yourself being there in the now, in the moment in your lesson, 
rather than potentially being distracted about other things that are yet to come or might never might never come or never happen. So that kind of brings me to the end of my my bit that I just wanted to talk about as well um, in terms of mindfulness. And if we can help develop our learners' mindfulness and our own mindfulness, we can improve everybody's well-being. That can improve motivation. And through greater levels of motivation, we can have greater levels of success and achievement, not only for our learners in their goals, but for us and our goals as teachers as well. So I'm going to hand back over to Chia now at this point, and she's going to tell you a little bit about the, the Pearson Cert PT course that we've been developing and all of these ideas today that we've told you about that we've taken out of the course. Thank you very much, Mike. Don't worry, you will see Mike again in a, in a couple of minutes. But um, <laughs> I'm back. And you're probably wondering, what is the connection between what Chia spoke about earlier, the interaction hypothesis, the noticing hypothesis, you know, how important it is to, 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 to foster a, an environment that can help our students become more communicatively competent. What has that got to do with motivation and mindfulness and well-being? How does this all fit in together? I'll tell you. They all come from module one of our course, our third PT course that we have written and developed, uh, Mike and myself. Um, and this is a three module course uh, accredited by Trinity. Um, and in module one, in every module, you'll have four units. And these are the four units of module one. Um, in unit one, from theory to practice, you will see a lot more about the different theories underlying second language acquisition, such as the interaction hypothesis, the noticing hypothesis. And, and we're not gonna be just focusing on the theory, but we're gonna look at how that theory translates into the real world, because after all, a good teacher is someone who doesn't just do what the course book says, but actually understands the principles that underlie what they're doing. I often say a good teacher is someone who, if you stopped in the middle of a lesson and say, hey, stop, why are you doing that? They would have a good answer for you whenever you stop them in a lesson. And I suppose in unit one, that's what we are trying to focus on, is getting you to really understand the theory underpinning everything that we do. In unit two, we look at the roles of a teacher, things like classroom management, lesson planning. In unit three, we talk about teaching in the real world with topics such as English as a lingua franca, socio-emotional learning, mindfulness, um, dealing with student errors in unit four, assessing students and how we can develop them further. And that's just in module one of the ELT methodology <clears throat> module. Um, and as I said, this is in our upcoming fully online course. Um, you can do it on your laptop, you can do it on your phone, um, and it is accredited level six um, by Trinity College London, and it's called the Certificate for Practicing English Language Teachers. Um, Mike is going to tell us a bit more about who the CERT PT is for. Oh, keep us both in there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so as Chia said, the, the, the clue is in the title. It's for practicing teachers, for teachers who want to develop themselves professionally, looking for an impetus to experiment and try out new things, to evaluate what they're currently doing in the classroom, the materials they're working with, um, and to think about how they can better adapt or even create their own materials to better fit the needs of their learners. Um, there are a couple of criteria for signing up. So um, trainees or participants will either need to have an initial teacher education qualification, for example, the CELTA or the Trinity Cert TESOL, and at least six months of teaching experience. Or if they don't have an initial teacher qualification, but they do have at least two years of teaching experience, then they can also gain entry onto the course. And so the focus very much is on practicing teachers, improving their, their skill and their ability and their craft in the classroom, as opposed to something for people who are learning how to teach. Yeah, well, uh, we, mentioned, for the first time. we mentioned level six qualification. What does that mean in the bigger scheme of things? <clears throat> if you think about CELTA, CELTA is the entry level qualification, is considered a level five qualification by Ofqual. And um, you have your Delta, your diploma, or your master's in language teaching, and that's a level seven. So the CERT PT sits right in the middle between the CELTA and the Delta, between your initial qualification and your master's qualification. So if you are a teacher thinking, you know, I really want to improve myself get a certification for that but not quite i'm not ready to do a master's degree yet then the cert pt might just be for you 
Brilliant. Cool. So I can see some people have asked for a course link um, and our colleagues from Pearson have just posted a course link into the um, into the chat field. So there's a link there to the catalog to give you a little bit further information. You might be thinking, well, tell me, look, how's the course structured? How does it fit together? What's my learning experience going to be like? And so we've also acknowledged that, um, you know, these days we all want shorter bites of input that is immediately usable in whatever context we're learning in. And so we've created 120 what we're calling micro lessons that you can do on a laptop or on a mobile phone. They'll take you 15 or 20 minutes to do them. And overall, it leads you to 100 hour plus of qualification time. So the idea behind the course is that you spend about eight months doing the learning content, and then you have two months to submit four assignment tasks. And the assignment tasks each focus on a different area of your teaching and the materials that you use to teach or the resources. So it's around adapting or evaluating, adapting, creating, and reflecting on your resources. Um, and you know, we're learners ourselves as well as teacher trainers and instructional designers. And so we've tried to create this course to be as engaging and as interesting as possible. So it's full of quizzes and, and we've got a podcast series in there as well. There's loads of videos, there's animations, there's a really cool feature around scenarios where you're presented with a teacher who is about to teach a class and has an issue and you have to decide, well, do I help them in A or in B? And then depending on how you choose, you get another scenario. So it's a bit like choose your own teaching adventure um, and many more different types of interactivity. Can I just comment on some of the questions that's coming up? Someone says, is this for teacher trainers or teachers? I'd say both, but mainly for teachers. So why theory for teachers, some of you ask? Because as I said, it's so important to really understand why we do what we do in the classroom and what other alternatives there are. You might be following a course book and have been doing the same thing for 20 years and, and thinking to yourself, you know, there must be a different way of teaching grammar. There must be a different way of looking at language learning. And this is the course that does doesn't just look at theory, but also then takes that theory and say, so based on that theory, we know about language learning. This mm -hmm. is what we know how about how languages are learned. And we're going to take that and we're going to show you lots of activities that you can do to make that a practical thing. Um, someone also asked, can you do this course really, really quickly? I know 15, 20 minutes per lesson sounds like very little. And you might say, I'm going to do 10 lessons a day. No, <laughs> no, do not do that. The lessons are meant to be, do not do more than one lesson a day. The lessons are meant to be standalone. That, that might be 20 minutes long, but there's a lot of material and content in that lesson. And you really need a day or more to reflect on what you've learned. So um, don't try and do it too quickly. <laughs> yeah, and, and in each lesson as well, we challenge you to complete a learning journal which will help you think about how can you apply what you've learned from that lesson into your own teaching context. So the idea in only doing kind of one a day or maybe four lessons a week or so, like spend maybe an hour, an hour and a half of learning a week, is that you've got time and reflection capacity to really try out what you've been learning in your classroom, reflect on how that's went, and then go back for some more learning content rather than just having content overload and not actually getting to practice it. So that's the core of this. It's for practicing teachers. And if you like some of the cartoons, the animations, the pictures and images you've seen in this webinar, they're all taken from the course. We've yeah. had an amazing video production team, an amazing designer, an uh, amazing technical team to help make this become a reality. So, you know, it's not just going to be input, input, input. You're going to have a chance to interact constantly, you know, through whether it's through podcasts or videos or through, you know, multiple choice questions, scenarios, hypothetical scenarios, there's a lot of interactivity going on on the course. Cool. So there's a couple of questions coming in around fees and things like that. I would say have a look at the catalog and get in touch with your local Pearson rep kind of in country because they're going to manage all that side of things. Someone else asked, what's the time investment per week? We'd recommend probably three or four lessons a week, which is probably around about an hour to an hour and a half of input learning time. But then it's what you do with that. You reflect on it. You do a bit of further reading. You try things out in your lessons so that it's a constant learning journey for you as you go through the program. Absolutely. Um, we've got some Facebook questions. This is being streamed on Facebook Live as well. And hey, we've Facebook. got some questions from Facebook users. Someone's asked me about my book. They asked if I could, they could find more creative and engaging ideas in my book. My book, the one you're referring to, is probably 
successful international communication. And that's that's mainly about communication strategies. So if you're looking for creative ideas and stories, someone's asked about stories for reason and gap, and lots of stories in my book, but that's mainly for communication strategies and less about ELT. Um, if you want to know more about how you can, for example, someone from Facebook says, what can I do with lazy pupils and uh, other creative and engaging ideas? I say, come do the CERT PT. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you a starting point there is to think about, well, why are they lazy? And, you know, is it to do with engagement? Is it to do with motivation? What can we do to interact with them more and to to focus on their interests and needs and things like that? But there's, there's, there's tons of ideas uh, in the course as well. So I'm trying to keep an eye on time because I'm aware that there's going to be other speakers probably coming in for the next session soon. And we've probably just about come to time. So I'd say thanks a lot to everyone on Facebook Live who has been watching. Thanks a lot to everyone here in, in this room in Click Meeting. Um, and this session uh, has been recorded and will be put on the Pearson English YouTube channel uh, probably in a week or so-ish. Um, and if anyone would like to connect with us on social media, we share teaching tips, ideas, interesting stuff we read, and so on. Um, you can kind of see different ways to connect with us there on this final slide. Right. Thank you for participating so actively and interacting and having that culture of interaction in this session. So yeah. thank you very much. <laughs>